Her Excellency, Minister Elena Bonetti, to all distinguished speakers who are present today, Professor Paola Profeta, Francesca Gesualdi, and Gaia van der Esch. My heartfelt welcome to all of you. I also would like to extend my appreciation to all PWA members connected virtually and to our guests who are present today. I am very delighted to welcome you all to PWA. The Professional Women's Association of Rome is a unique place for business professionals who have distinguished themselves for their skills, human qualities, courage, sensitivity and determination, but also models to follow for the younger generations. In my capacity as the president of PWA, I am proud to work alongside inspiring, dynamic women of diverse backgrounds and cultures. Since 1992, PWA has promoted gender equality, empowerment, and leadership of women in the world of work. We will continue our mission to support women in their professional development and support strategic partnerships that promote women economic empowerment, lifelong learning, and equal access to employment opportunities. You might already know that women's employment fell globally by 4.2% in 2020, compared with 3% for men. And when it comes to our individual careers, 47% of all existing professions are expected to become unnecessary in the next years. That's just talking about business. The future has never been more uncertain for women and girls, especially when it comes to education and employment. This is particularly acute for the most marginalized and at risk in our societies. 80% of young women are worried about their future, and one in six young people worldwide have lost their job pandemic. Whether we look at the business, society, environment, or beyond, everything around us is for a strong reinvention skills, for that remarkably ability not only to survive, but to thrive in change. Before the pandemic hit, already face a 99-year wait before expected to enjoy full equality with men. The effects of COVID-19 have increased the by almost 40 years to 136, according to the estimates by the World Economic Forum. According to the Italian Prime Minister during the G20 W20 summit in August 20, G20 can play and will play an essential role in supporting women worldwide. It's time to take concrete steps to improve women's position in the workforce, improve female power leaders, and together remove the obstacles that hold women back in their careers. I am immensely proud that PWA has the opportunity to host the People, Planet, and Prosperity, the Gap in Gender Equality Conference. This conference couldn't have come at a more opportune time. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected women and men differently due to the distinct roles in economies and societies. So responding to the crisis without first assessing its impact on gender equality jeopardizes efforts to build back together. Let us help each other to help the right to find the right solutions and hands-on responses to our challenges. I am personally calling your active support to see gender equality as an integral part of the solution to the many challenges we face in terms of health, climate, economy, and fundamental human rights. I am convinced that your active participation here today, this evening, will give rise to a fruitful exchanges. The success of this conference depends on you. Your active involvement in and contribution to the discussion will be of vital importance in seeking effective and practical measures to promote gender equality. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce you our Vice President and Moderator for tonight, Catherine costa -Ju. Thank you very much, Gerli. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here tonight at the first conference of PWA for this season. The topic is People, Planet, and Prosperity, the Gap in Gender Equality. 
and the choice of the topic it's uh it, it's clear i mean as you, yes, you probably know italy is holding the presidency of the g20 this year and the focus of the g20 are two uh, main three main pillars that are strictly interconnected people planet and prosperity leaders from all over the world have came to address and discuss some pressing issues including uh, uh, recovery from the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, climate change, as well as, um, as, as, as climate change. We have seen in all this context that women empowerment and closing the gender gap is essential for recovery. And this is why we have invited today um, at our conference an outstanding panel of, of speakers that will give us an overview of where does Italy stand when it comes to gender equality and closing the gap in gender equality. First of all, I will introduce our first speaker, which is Francesca Gesualdi. She's a, a lawyer at the international law firm Cleary Goldstein and Hamilton, where she represents regularly clients on high uh, stake disputes. I have had the pleasure and honor to work with her, and I know that she's a fierce bull opponent and uh, an amazing litigator, and I, I, I would recommend having her uh, as a female in court. Uh, Francesca, could you please provide us an overview of what is um, the framework and the legal framework in Italy when it comes to uh, gender equality? Yes, thank you, Katrin. Uh, thank you also for the flattering introduction, and thank you, PWA. Uh, I have to say that I'm really honored to speak in the panel tonight uh, and uh, uh, I also have to say I feel some pressure both because I'm not I'm definitely not um, an authority in this field like my fellow speakers and also because I'm probably the one uh, speaking about the less entertaining topic we just Catherine was saying is a roundup of the main legal measure legal measure in Italy uh, to address uh, and try to uh, resolve the gender gap. So we try to keep it simple and uh, uh, I will also try to give you some of my personal, uh, to share with you some of my personal experience and views. First, I will try to share the presentation. Let me, let me try. Share screen. Okay. Okay, so uh, to begin with, um, as a lawyer, I can definitely say I have uh, a real first hand experience of uh, the gender gap and stereotypes of Italian culture. I have a collection of examples that, uh, you know, may, may, may even sound uh, hilarious or uh, stupid, but instead I think they give a, a quite a clear picture of uh, where we stand so in culturally and uh, in, in more, more generally in the, uh, in the profession. As a lawyer, as I was saying, I found myself many times to be uh, the only women both uh, in court uh, or in client meetings. Uh, and uh, for example, when I was working, <laughs> including with Katrin uh, on complex international construction uh, litigation arbitration, I would regularly have to deal with uh, uh, Italian engineers in their 70s, 60s or 70s, uh, which would have a very hard time just calling me avvocato. They would call me signorina, which was okay, signora, dottoressa, but they would never say uh, at least at the, at the first two or three meetings avvocato. Um, another example, which is also um, made sound uh, funny, I remember when I was working in Rome, I would ask the driver to drive me to Piazza di Spagna 15, where uh, the office was, and uh, the drivers would uh, many times uh, ask me if I was working at the uh, bags shop, Furla, which was uh, just around the corner from the office. But, you know, I can go on, on and on, but I think you, uh, you understand what, uh, what, I, what I mean. Um, I, also, I also think that, uh, uh, especially as women profession, we also have our own uh, bias uh, and uh, uh, stereotypes. 
um, because I think that uh, especially we are, we, when we are overall lucky, we tend to think that there are always must there, 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 there is always an explanation for a woman to um, give up on her career. Maybe we think she's not good enough, she's not smart enough, she's not committed enough. Uh, she only wanted to be a man, mom, and she's happy like that. And I think this is very dangerous. It, this is a very dangerous misconception, and that's why event like the one of uh, that was organized by PWA are very important because they uh, help us looking beyond our backyard and uh, really trying to see the big picture. And as Katrina and, uh, and in, the, in the introduction uh, was, say, uh, was saying, uh, the, the situation in Italy is quite, uh, I mean, it's quite dramatic, I have to say, uh, although there have been some improvement. Italy ranks uh, 63 out of, uh, at the international level, out of 156 country which means that the Italian position is closer to countries like Uganda or Bangladesh, uh, rather than, for example, Germany or uh, Spain, uh, which ranks 11 and 14. At the European level, the situation is, uh, is, not, either even, uh, is not either brilliant. Uh, Italy is uh, um, uh, 14 out of 28. Um, this is not actually surprising uh, if you think that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it was only in the last 50 years that measure, uh, actual measures were taken uh, in Italy to try to address uh, the gender gap. I have put uh, uh, a, some of the most relevant, you can see them on the timeline, we're not uh, going to see them all. Uh, but uh, um, we, uh, we, we, we will only see the, the most relevant. The starting point is obviously our constitutions uh, and especially Article 3, 37 and 51. Uh, they are on screen. I give you a few seconds to read them yourself. Article 3, Article 37 and Article 51. Um, of course, I mean, although very important, uh, a simple declaration of principle like the one contained in the Constitution are clearly not enough. Uh, and this is so true that basically nothing happened until, uh, at least until the 70s uh, and, uh, you know, with the feminist movement. But even then, uh, the, 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 the reforms that were enacted, and you can see them on the screen, um, the, the focus of this reform was mainly to prevent discrimination and violence against, against women rather than to actually promote with positive and affirmative action uh, gender equality. So I put some example, the, abolition, the abolishment of honor killing in uh, 1981, uh, the, the, the worker status in, uh, earlier in 1970, the uh, law in 1996, uh, which uh, um, changed rape from being an offense against morality to an offense against uh, a person. Um, but it was only later on, um, I would say at the end uh, of the 90s, uh, thanks to the push of the European Union, that uh, these concrete and uh, affirmative measures started to be implemented and they can be divided into two main sets. Uh, the measures that are aimed at uh, promoting empl uh, women employment and the measures that are uh, aimed at promoting uh, rep uh, women representation in uh, uh, leadership position. Um, as to the first sets of measure, one, uh, the, the, the first mi milestone is certainly the um, National Code of Equal Opportunities, which was enacted in 2006, uh, and which, besides uh, uh, reaffirming the prohibition of any discrimination, uh, uh, provides both for positive action to promote women employment and to and, uh, uh, potential remedies and sanction against uh, uh, the code's violation. So, for example, it, uh, it provides for a system of funding of professional training and other educational programs. Uh, reporting obligation on corporation on the situation of gender equality, and uh, as I was saying, remedy, uh, actual remedy, uh, remedies and sanctions. Um, the, uh, the, the code was followed by a number of other measures. I'm going back of one slide. I'm not speaking about them all, but they, they, uh, as the, the minister will probably say, I mean, the, the, the measure 
uh, miss a comprehensive structure and are kind of scattered. And that's one of the problems for sure. Uh, and this measure range from uh, babysitting check, for example, introduced with Legge for Nero to uh, a number of incentives that were introduced by the financial acts, uh, including in the last one to uh, promote uh, to, uh, to promote uh, um, through uh, fiscal benefit uh, women recruitment. So despite these uh, positive measures uh, and the uh, and developments, the situation uh, of women in the job market is still not great. Uh, you uh, can consider that uh, while women represent 56% of Italian graduates, they are only 28% uh, of Italian managers, uh, which is quite telling. And one of the other where the gap is particularly serious is the salary gap. Uh, and again, the gap is particularly uh, is broader at the, ma at the manager level. Possible explanation, of course, the, um, the, 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 the manager contracts are more flexible and negotiable. And also there is always, I believe, some degree of discretion in, in any uh, promotion and advancement of career choice that can make, uh, uh, you know, can make easy to hide uh, discrimi discriminatory conduct. Going to uh, the second set of measure uh, and, those to, and, the, and those to the measure aim at uh, improving uh, women representation in, the, uh, in, uh, in leadership position. First of all, I want to say, to state the obvious uh, and, and in particular that the, the, the lack of women in leadership position is not only a, a problem per se, it's also a problem of perception and uh, agenda. Uh, because it goes without saying that when important decisions are taken on women's life and women uh, employment are taken prevailingly by men, an important part of the picture is missed. And that, uh, and it's also true that when you don't uh, leave uh, um, a specific problem on your skin, uh, it, it will hardly become a top priority in your agenda. Anyway, a an impor very important step uh, in this field is uh, certainly the Golfo, the, the, um, Golfo Mosca law, which was enacted in uh, 2011 and which now provides, as amended in 2020, um, that uh, a certain percentage of, uh, we, uh, of uh, seats in the boards of listed company and then public participation companies shall be uh, occupied by women, and this is, uh, of course, uh, a, a very important step. CONSOP supervise on the respect of the rules and can impose sanctions. Uh, I have to say that uh, on a positive note that according to a report, so far only uh, five companies receive a warning from CONSOP and actually cured the breach uh, within the following four months. There has been a long debate uh, between uh, those who were in favor and those who were against the pink quotas. I believe that the data, again, are very telling um, because they show that, um, uh, that uh, women-led companies uh, uh, experience uh, a significant increase in revenues. We are speaking about 6-7% and this number doubles when at least 20% 20 of, 20 of the company's employees are women. Uh, to conclude with my roundup, I just wanted to um, spend a few words on the, on the recovery plan, uh, which will probably be um, described also by, my, by the other speakers. I think the plan uh, is, uh, although it's still, of course, only a declaration of principle and objective and goals to be enacted by 2026, I think it's very important both from a um, cultural point of view, because it puts gender equality on top the of the agenda, finally, and because uh, uh, and from a financial point of view. In fact, the plans recognize that uh, what was still really missing uh, were real investments uh, on uh, women development and women career. And to this end, the, the, the funds, uh, in, among other things, they envisage a fund, uh, which is called uh, uh, Fondo Impresa Donne and will be a 400 million uh, funds uh, and, and, and which will be devoted to support uh, women business and enterprises. 
So uh, one, one last thing about the gap, uh, it also takes a position uh, on the um, pay gap uh, and uh, envisage a system of national certification, uh, which will also focus on this issue. Um, I, on you know, uh, another positive note, I think I, did, I, I want to mention at the beginning of this week, uh, probably in the wake of this uh, um, positive wave, uh, 30 CEOs uh, of international and national companies signed the, uh, the zero gender gap plan. Um, which of course marks a very important commitment also by the uh, business community. Uh, so my roundup is, uh, uh, is almost over. Um, and unfortunately, I cannot see your face. I can only see the face of, of the other speaker, but I'm sure that some in the, of, the of the attendees might have, have uh, while I was speaking about this, all these nice principles, rules and goals, they might have had the same glance uh, and uh, uh, thoughts of Greta. I don't know if you heard her uh, at her um, latest public appearance. Uh, I can summarize her, uh, her thoughts, uh, although uh, given on different topics. Uh, gender equality by the next 10 years, blah, blah, blah. Zero gender gap, blah, blah, blah. No more gender gap, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so, because I think that the feeling, besides all, you know, this, uh, this, this positive, uh, this uh, encouraging development is that there is still much to be done and that we are really, uh, we really got to the point where we really want to see uh, serious and greater results. Uh, of course, what is needed and that will take and it will take time to achieve is a deep uh, cultural shift because women are still uh, are still perceived and are and still are uh, the primary uh, caregivers uh, and the one expected to quit their job uh, for family purposes. Uh, the COVID pandemic, as uh, um, as uh, we was said at the beginning, uh, made that uh, as clear as ever. Um, out of uh, uh, in uh, in 2020, uh, there were um, 77 of, of uh, the resignation were women resignation, and out of uh, one uh, 100,000 unemployed, uh, new unemployed, 98 percent were women. So again, I don't want to give you only number and uh, uh, abstract. Uh, Principle. I, I again. I speak. I mean. I understand. I. I, I think. I, I speak because uh, based on my personal um, personal experience. If I didn't find the person during the lockdown to live with us, uh, to live with the fact to come and live in with us, I would. I would have, have. I would have probably had to quit the job for a while, take a leave because it was totally impossible to reconcile uh, work and family. Um, at the same time, I saw myself, and I'm sure you heard about this debate, this kind of super stereotyped uh, exercise in my daughter uh, textbook in primary school. I think you are almost all Italian, but she had to choose uh, uh, verbs that were action that were um, suitable for mom, and the option were cooks, irons, and sets. Uh, so quite easy choice, and for that were uh, works, reads, and crocs or cracks. I don't even know how to, uh, how to say it in English. Um, but I also have to say on another positive note that thanks to the changes we are uh, already going through as a society and as families, my other daughter uh, was totally free from stereotypes when she uh, had to, when she was asked to complete uh, freely this exercise, which was the game of the while. So she wrote, she had to put, uh, you know, the temporary two, two sentences in temporary connection, and she wrote, I, "I eat ice cream while my mom works," and that was, that made me quite proud, I have to say. Um, anyway. To, 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 to go to the conclusion, of course, uh, um, I don't have any uh, easy recipe nor easy advice to give, but I think uh, uh, that's something that we really start doing ourselves without waiting for, you know, measure to be taken, uh, uh, funds to be put in place, etc., etc., is to start promote ourselves. 
because women really struggle uh, when it comes to uh, speaking about their accomplishment. Probably it's for modest norm that they talked us since we were we are kids. But this is definitely something we need to learn from men, which are very good at, uh, at that. Uh, just think that uh, according to researches, men apply for a position when they think they satisfy 66% of the requirements, while, while we apply only if we believe we, um, we satisfy uh, 100%. Uh, generally speaking, I think that we are Given, given we are all we are generally well prepared, diligent and, pra and diligent and pragmatic, we tend to believe that uh, results uh, we speak from for ourselves uh, for for themselves, uh, and that will gain us promotion, salary raise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is a serious and uh, dangerous misconception. We really need to start. Uh, um, self-promote ourselves and not be afraid of make clear of what our goals and expectations are uh, at the workplace. Otherwise, uh, uh, despite any measure will be taken, I'm sure we will uh, be left behind. Thank you, Francesca, very much for this very comprehensive presentation and also for your advice. Uh, we have seen from, from your presentation that Italy has indeed enacted several measures in the last uh, 10 years that had uh, an impact on trying to close the gender gap. And thanks also to these measures, uh, Italy gained some position in the European Gender Index and it's now on the 14th uh, place. But that's not enough. And uh, that's not enough, surely from one side, because of what also Francesca was uh, underlying, we women are not educated to promote ourselves and sometimes we're waiting for someone to help us. But there are also some other reasons that are economically related. And uh, with this, I'll uh, pass to our next speaker, who is Professor Paola Profetta. She's a full professor of public economics at the Bocconi University. She regularly publish uh, uh, and her research is focused on gender economics. Uh, Paula, what, is, um, what are the economics underlying uh, gender equality related issues and why uh, we have so much uh, to be done on, on this issue? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you for organizing this, uh, this event. I also have some slides just to uh, to keep you uh, okay, so if you can uh, please allow me to to share my slides because uh, uh, just to uh, to I think it's easier to follow. But uh, uh, as um, okay, at the moment I cannot share my slides. Uh, but as Catherine was uh, um, was uh, was saying. Uh, uh, I I will talk from uh, uh, from an economic point of view, and I will tell you what are uh, mainly uh, the economic determinants of gender gaps, and also uh, somehow what we can do to uh, address the issue. So now I can. Okay. So this is. Uh, uh, I think you can see my screen, right? Uh, Yes, we can see your screen now. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Okay, so uh, from the economic point of view, of course, uh, um, many things have been said, and uh, uh, and uh, and we know that uh, uh, it's not an easy, uh, it's not really an easy phenomenon, and it's not easy at all to understand what are the economic determinants uh, of uh, gender gaps, but also what are the consequences. So, in the in the short time that I have, I would like to provide you like an overview of uh, what uh, research and uh, you know i mean libraries uh, about this have uh, tried to uh, to to establish so as it was said before uh, no basically we have to start from the fact that no country in the world has reached gender equality so this is true it's a, it's a problem in italy but it's a problem everywhere because no country has really uh, closed the gender gap 
And in particular, if, uh, but of course there are differences. I mean, the best performers like Iceland, Finland, Norway, and Sweden uh, have uh, done much more progress than, uh, than, uh, than our country. So they have closed around 90% of the gender gap. Italy is around uh, 70%. In general, when we consider the different dimensions of gender gaps, so these are health, education, economic results, and political empowerment, the, the worst results are uh, uh, in the area of economic results, so economic, economic participation, labor market, etc., and political empowerment. So in the world, only 58% of the gap in economic results has been closed so far, and only 22 in the gap of the gap in political empowerment. And I will also try to tell you that the two things are actually quite uh, quite connected, and we will see uh, the, the channels uh, behind uh, behind them. So uh, what is the, the most, let's say, uh, striking uh, data when we talk about economic component and economic uh, gender gaps? Uh, this is the female labor uh, employment rate. So if you look here, this are male and female employment rate for European countries uh, uh, for population in the age between 20 and 64 years old. And you see that uh, uh, in some countries, uh, you know, the difference between male and female is not, uh, is not uh, uh, very high. Italy ranks very badly in uh, in this, and this is uh, what I think is the the worst. Uh, I mean, the, the most serious problem. Uh, although there are many others that sometimes attract uh, the attention also policymakers and and scholars. But it, it, this is the, the 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 major problem. If we don't solve this, we don't solve anything. And thus, uh, so you see, Italy is really a uh, working class, uh, followed only by uh, by Greece. And you see the difference between female and female employment rate is that is striking. And so our female employment rate is around 50%, which means that in our country, one out of two women don't um, uh, doesn't work. So um, we had also, in terms of European recommendation, uh, you know, a recommendations of reaching, for example, 60% in back in 2010. So uh, something that. Uh, did not happen, and uh, uh, the new target for 2020 was 75 percent for both men and women, and obviously we did not reach uh, this one. So uh, we are very far from uh, from all the, poly the the European policy recommendations. And if you also follow and uh, and follow a little bit, you know, the plan uh, for recovery for the, the the sheer recovery that was mentioned even before. I mean, they talk about very few percentage points uh, in terms of uh, female employment rate. So we are, I mean, and, and this is probably very little because uh, we are very, very uh, back. So we are very uh, behind. So um, if we, uh, re if our uh, target is to have female employment rate and increase by uh, by five percent, this is certainly not enough because we are still very far from the from the target. So uh, this, of course, uh, is really in contradiction with uh, with what happens in the education sector, which was the other dimension where the gap has been more or less closed. Because when we talk about the share of graduates, for example, so here we consider only the very young population, so between 25 and 34 years old. In Europe, Italy is again on the right uh, on the right hand uh, side. Uh, so uh, this is a problem in general because we have a very little share of graduates in general, male and female. And you see, we are followed only by Romania. Uh, but uh, uh, but in the gap in the gap between men and women, we are doing well in the sense that now uh, women, I mean, the share of female graduates is much larger than the share of male graduates. Of course, this doesn't mean that we don't have any problem in terms of education, because if you go a little bit deeper into this analysis, you will find that that fields of study for men and women are very different. And that there is that, you know, this problem of this cost, the lack of women in the so-called uh, STEM disciplines, so science, technology, engineering, math, which we know have become more and more important during the pandemic. And we also know that they give higher returns, higher, uh, higher wages, uh, so uh, lower risk and uh, higher returns on the labor market. So we will see uh, also here uh, some problems if we don't close the digital gap or the technology gap between men and women, which is still uh, quite far. Then 
when we move to the to the top, so we move to the decision making positions, both in business and in politics, the situation is not much better. Of course, you say you can imagine we start from 50% of the population who is not even working, the, the female population. And so uh, those who arrive in top position as they are very, are very little. And this is the phenomenon which is called the glass ceiling. So there are uh, it's kind of uh, uh, obstacles for women to uh, in reaching top positions. And you see even here that Italy is not performing very well compared to the other uh, to the other European countries. This is the share among the presidents, board members, and representatives of the larger listed companies. And you see that actually the progress that we have made is because of the quota law that was mentioned even before. That's basically the only dimension where we have uh, uh, we have seen uh, a lot of progress in the gender gaps in Italy in the last uh, in the last decade because there was. Uh, an imposition, an introduction of a mandatory gender quotas on boards. If we go largely on uh, on decision making positions, on the managers, etc., women are still scarcely represented. But on the really top, which is the boards of uh, listed companies, that uh, we are performing quite uh, uh, quite well. Uh, this is in politics, and again, even if we talk about politics, uh, uh, in this case, Italy is more or less in the middle of the uh, of the distribution. Uh, but still, you see here it's quite striking that basically, no, in no country we have fifty percent of women in the national parliaments, and these are only European countries. So we are uh, below forty uh, percent, which is uh, uh, again uh, something far from uh, a fair representation because you know the women represent fifty percent of the population but still account for less than 40% of these positions in a, uh, in a democracy. Okay, so what are, uh, from the economic point of view, what are the factors? And I will try to uh, to tell you briefly, I mean, this is a big scheme, which is something that then if you have time and, and you want, you can um, you can probably go to one of these uh, uh, books that I have recently written, which, where, which contains a lot of this uh, information, studies, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, I mean, better explanation of what I am saying. Uh, the, the book is called Gender Equality and Public Policy. It's a, it's a Cambridge University Press edition in English, and it has been translated into Italian in Parità di Genere e Politiche Pubbliche from Bocconi University uh, edition. Okay, so there are a lot of factors, and uh, and I will try to uh, to give you, uh, I mean, very rapidly uh, information about some of these factors that the, the stay behind the uh, the gender gaps. As I said, gender gaps may be in education, in the labor market, employment, wages, careers, et cetera, so far and so on, and in politics. But what's behind is a lot of these factors, which I try to summarize here. But let me give you, uh, I mean, some more details of uh, of each. Uh, of them, and then we go back to this to this graph. So first of all, there is the the, the usual uh, idea that there is a kind of motherhood penalty. I mean, the child penalty, and of course this is true because women with children work less than women without children. I mean, biologically, women uh, have children. So, uh, so this, uh, the, the, this penalty related to having children is uh, is an important factor behind the gender gaps. And we see here for several countries, you see Italy is not even there. So this is true everywhere. Uh, that, uh, you know, at time zero, which is the, the time when your, uh, your first child uh, was born, there is a clearly a clear decrease in the wages of uh, uh, in the earnings of women in all countries. While basically nothing happens for men. I mean, the earnings of men stay uh, stay the same around zero before and after. And for women, there is a, a sharp decrease. And then, they, in some countries. It seems possible to recover a little bit to go back to the initial position, but in no, in in, in none of these countries we uh, we come back to the to the to the initial trend. So uh, having children is a penalty still for women uh, on the labor market, and this has been described for all countries. And you have, uh, I mean, really a lot of evidence. 
But I would like to add, I mean, it would be, uh, it would be unfair, let's say, to say that uh, maternity explains everything. So we have, uh, I mean, we have the answer. I mean, we have the gender gap because economically, uh, women are paid less, they work less, they are penalized, etc., just because they're mothers. I mean, this is not, uh, this is not what this uh, type of evidence suggests, because if we go a little bit uh, deeper, we see that actually maternity cannot explain everything about what we observe. But this is simply because we know that if we look at across countries, there are countries where it is possible to have high female employment rates and high fertility rates. So if maternity explains everything or most of the story about gender gap, so we should expect actually uh, a negative relationship between the number of children and the uh, female employment rate, because we should expect that, you know, having children or working for pay is somehow a trade-off, an alternative, uh, an alternative decision. And this was true in the past. But if you look now across countries, this is not true anymore. And actually in this graph, uh, I plot the female employment rate in European countries uh, on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, I have the fertility rate. And you see the countries where women work more are also the countries where they have more children. So how can we explain this? Of course, it's, uh, it's diff it does suggest that it's possible an equilibrium where you have more women at work and higher fertility rate, and you 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 don't have to think about the two as a, as an alternative, which is kind of good news and uh, you know new thing for uh, for uh, for the economy. But it's also uh, but, so it's good news, but uh, not for Italy because you see where Italy is in this graph is that is uh, on the uh, on the. Um, bottom level on the uh, on the left and actually it means that we are somehow trapped into bad equilibrium with low female employment rate and low fertility rate so it's not good news for our country and the graph also suggests that obviously there should be something that explains the positive versus the negative equilibrium so something like you know the context the type of policies the type of regulations that were mentioned before or even the culture of the country so there are places where you can actually reach a positive equilibrium with with high fertility rate and high female employment, but you need to change a little bit the culture and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and the rules of the game and also the policy. And talking about culture, this is one of the fundamental explanations why we still have a lot of gender, high gender gaps. And actually here you see some data from World Value Survey on where there is only explicit attitudes towards, uh, uh, towards gender gaps. But even with the explicit, we still have a lot of differences across countries. This is plays a, a, a big part of the gaps that we observe between male and female employment rates. So on the left, you have the, the question when jobs are scarce, men should have more rights to a job than women. So people in the world, in the different countries are asked whether they agree or not with the statement. And you see that uh, it's quite impressive that in Italy, the percentage of people who agree with this uh, statement is much higher than in all the other countries that I, uh, that I have plotted here like France, Germany, Sweden is almost zero, the percentage of agreement. So actually there is a strong resistance with respect to the role of women on the labor market. And if you look on the right, so this is the question, preschool child suffers if the mother works. And actually, again, here, the share of uh, uh, people who agree with this statement in Italy is much higher than in the other considered countries. So it seems that there is a kind of attitude towards the, the role of women on the labor market, the role of women as mothers and workers, which is a little bit negative, much more negative in Italy with respect to the other countries. And we can prove uh, with, uh, with research that this is one of the big explanation of our uh, high gender gap. Of course, this is only the tip of the iceberg because these are explicit bias. So people are asked what they think about this statement. There are a lot of, we know from the literature, a lot of implicit biases. So many people, they think they, they are open to, the, to, to women on the labor market, et cetera, but then implicitly they are not. So this is only, let's say, the tip of the iceberg. 
Uh, there are many other factors. For example, another factor which is related to uh, to culture, but uh, it's uh, at the end an economic decision is uh, you know how many hours men and women work uh, at home with respect to to the market. And again, in Italy, the extra hours per week spent by women on unpaid duties around the home compared to men is really much higher than in uh, the other considered countries. And we know again that if women spend a lot of time, I mean, if there is no uh, gender balance uh, in the allocation of a household, uh, of a housework and child care within the couple, so between men and women, this has important economic consequences because the more balanced is the allocation of this work, and the higher is the participation of women into the labor force, in particular of mothers, and also the fertility rate. So another important part of the story is that uh, we lack the sharing of responsibilities in the family, in household, between men and, and women, and this is part of the explanation. Of course, this has also implication on what we call the demand side, so in terms of firms, because if there is no balance within the family, we cannot expect to have balance on the labor market, let's say within the firms, because firms simply anticipate what's going to happen within the family. So they tend to, um, to promote men more than women just because, uh, because they expect from men uh, higher activity uh, levels than, than women because they know this data, as, as, as I said. So if they expect women to have all this burden of the house, of the uh, of the child care uh, etc uh, firms are going to prefer uh, men uh, to women and then again into the family if men have higher possibilities in terms of opportunities of career again within the family it will be the correct choice to allocate housework and child care in an unbalanced way so it's a kind of a negative equilibrium which is a trap which can, we can also derive uh, uh, more precisely in economic terms but at the end uh, what happens within the family translate also into the labor market. In the labor market, there are also additional elements, for example, from the demand side. So when we look at firms, there are additional elements. For example, a lot of studies have emphasized the so-called non-neutrality of the selection process. So there is this famous example by by a, a very influential paper by Golden and Rose, where they show that uh, in, uh, in the US, when they moved from blind auditions uh, for selecting the musicians for a, an American orchestra, and when they moved from blind auditions to, uh, when, when, when they moved uh, um, from, uh, I mean, they put a screen when, uh, in, the, in the auditions, so you could not, uh, observe uh, the sex of the musician, so the evaluators could not observe the sex of the musician, this increased the likelihood that females advanced in the hiring process and finally were hired. So it's also that there are a lot of bias in terms of the implicit in the selection process. Uh, okay, so let me go back for a second here. So basically, we have all these factors on the left. It's very difficult to say. There are also, uh, I mean, we call uh, uh, the, the, the last part can be called the discrimination. There are several types of discrimination, even uh, a discrimination which is not legally, uh, legally, um, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, it's, it's perfectly fine in terms of rules and regulation because uh, it's a uh, statistical discrimination or taste discrimination or implicit discrimination. So it's very difficult to talk about uh, a legal framework to prevent this discrimination. It's something that has to do with the more economic uh, stories and uh, we cannot simply uh, avoid this by putting uh, the right law. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more complex. And also the role of men, I, I already said, and there are also these psychological factors that, that now in the literature we know they play a much more important role. So we cannot, say, we don't have to say that men and women are, are equal, are the same, they are different, they have different traits, but those different traits may translate into, for example, less aggressiveness, less uh, uh, competitiveness of women, uh, more risk adverse, etc. And at the end, in many, in many types of, uh, you know, depending on the context of the labor market, depending so depending on the firm, this may may explain why women are not successful in very competitive uh, environments. Of course, it's very difficult to say whether this factors depends on what we call the nature or the nurture. 
but pretty much more on the nurture, so on the context, because culture is not something we are lived uh, with. I mean, it's something that depends on where we live. So it can be manipulated also by policies, by family relationships, etc. So there is something that I call a public channel because public policy play an important role here. We know that when there are childcare services, when there are paternity leaves, for example, this may be important to reduce gender gaps. So for example, if you think about the determinant, one of the determinants that I mentioned is the role, uh, the involvement of father into the family, which has implications on the labor market, so on, uh, on the firms. So when you think about this, uh, the, 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 the natural answer would be, okay, so let's introduce paternity leaves, which is what many countries are doing, including our uh, paternity leaves that are exclusive for the father so that fathers participate more to uh, household activities, to child care activities, and this is going to reduce the gender gap. So uh, policies in the sense are important, there are policy responses that are important to reduce the gender gap. Another uh, important part of the story is the, uh, the quota law that was mentioned before. Even in this case, we are correcting a, a status quo which was not, uh, was not balanced and that this implies the reduction of uh, the gender gap. So these are the so-called public channels. On the other side, however, I would like to mention also that there is something that I call a political channel, uh, which goes in that direction. The direction that when women are, uh, I mean, women reach certain position, for, both in education, in the labor market, in politics, especially political empowerment, this may also feedback into uh, a reduction of gender gaps because there is a clear change of the context, a change of the environment, a change, for example, also of the policy itself. Suppose that there are more women in decision-making positions, in firms, or uh, in politics. So this is not neutral with respect to the decisions that are taken within the firms or within the, 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 the political arena or within the public policy. So this is a channel that somehow can initiate a, a virtuous, uh, a political channel that can initiate a virtuous circle. So uh, to conclude, I wanted to give you a, a couple of information about the COVID-19. Uh, it has been already said that COVID was a kind of she session. So the pandemic has, uh, um, I mean, was stronger uh, on women uh, uh, rather than on men because the women are more vulnerable on the labor market and also because of the factors of activities. So in economic terms, differently from uh, the previous crisis, which basically were all men session, uh, so uh, the finance, the industry, all male dominated sectors were hit by, by the previous crisis. This, uh, the pandemic, which is, uh, uh, I mean, a health crisis, but also an economic one, uh, uh, strongly affected the service sector. And women are, uh, women are uh, more employed in the service sector. So this is why we call it a she session. And the other part of the story of the session is also that family responsibilities increased a lot during the lockdown. Uh, so we can think about the closure of schools, etc. And uh, uh, here you see what, I mean, uh, what was the impact uh, within the household? So here we have estimated the number of hours per day um, for um, that uh, women accounted for housework, childcare, distance learning, and their partners. And we see that with respect to the pre-COVID situation, during the pandemic, women really increased, both in the first and in the second wave, increased the time they have spent in housework, childcare, and supporting in distance learning of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, of their children. Uh, men also did something more with respect to the pre-COVID situation, but most of the uh, burden has still fallen on women. That was not obvious, at least to me. So to, 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 to speak on the positive side, let's say, so still not obvious because, uh, for example, the use of distance work something, I mean, what we call, uh, we call commonly um, smart work, which was more a distance work because it was not very smart actually, but distance working may increase with father's involvement into the family, man's involvement into the family simply because they spend some time at home. 
And this, in the long run, may help rebalancing the roles, which, as I said before, are one of the main determinants of the gender gaps that also we observe within the firms. So there is still some hope, let's say, that in the future, this type of mechanism will, will appear, although so far we have not seen uh, in the data uh, this type of uh, new uh, equilibrium. And the last one is uh, the last evidence that I would like to show you is more related to the, to the female leadership during the pandemic. So there is a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, suggesting that you know women perform better than men uh, during the pandemic. And here, what I show is uh, the, that uh, uh, on the left side that uh, countries led, governments led by women uh, closed the school less than governments led by men. These are data, I mean, our type of research that we did on, uh, on original data. Uh, so it's a kind of index of, close, uh, of school closing across uh, different countries. And you see that the, the index for men is mainly, is uh, very highly concentrated around the three, which is the highest possible, and for women around one, which is the lowest as possible. And on the, on the right, also the index of income support, women tend to provide more income support than, uh, than men. So they are not the same, which is the political channel that, that I suggested. So when men and women are in leadership positions, they probably do not act exactly as they say, because they care about also different things. So the heavy mind that, for example, uh, closing the schools, this is controlling for the number of beds, etc. So uh, um, they have in mind that probably closing schools is not uh, uh, is not so easy for uh, in particular for uh, you know for other women in the society. So uh, why this is important for the economy? So uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, you know factors behind, but why is this important? This is important, and actually it is because it's included as the goal number five. Uh, of the UN Sustainable Development Goals for 2030, because when more women work, uh, uh, GDP increases. I mean, there are a lot of estimates that suggest how much GDP increases with higher participation of women into the labor force. Fertility increases, we have seen this, and growth is also more sustainable for, uh, I mean, what you, uh, you may think about uh, what, uh, what's the concept of sustainability. We don't have time to go into the details of this, but, that's an important part of the story. And when women are part of the leadership, that's the second step, there are also a lot of advantages, which mean, doesn't mean that we get rid of all the men and we take only women in leadership position. Of course, we only we always talk about the, uh, a balanced leadership, but there are a lot of advantages. Advantages not for women, but for everybody. And I can summarize those advantages, let's say, in three groups. The first one is the selection. So when women take part into the leadership positions, everybody's better selected, not only women, but also men. So, uh, and it's also an incentive for other women to take part to, you know, uh, to the race, to the top positions. Actually, we have seen this very clearly uh, with the introduction of gender quotas awards. Uh, people uh, who enter the board, uh, not only women, are better selected when there are the quotas because men are better selected when they have, uh, you know, now there are also women around. The second, the second is in terms of outcomes. We have, again, here, uh, library suggesting that uh, when, when the leadership is gender balanced, uh, uh, firm's performance increases, so growth is more sustainable, and there may be also a, a more balanced agenda in public policies, as I tried to suggest before. So we, for example, we have evidence that when there are women, in decision-making positions in politics, they also, uh, I mean, it's easier to have expenditure in childcare and uh, this type of uh, uh, items that at the end are good for gender equality. And the last part is in terms of this uh, uh, trait. Men and women are different. So what's, what's, what, what's better is to have both men and women decision-making positions because, for example, their, uh, their behavior with respect to risky situation is different. Women tend to have a more interpersonal orientation, more democratic style of leadership. They are more future-oriented. They are more risk-averse. They have a moderate competition. And they look at the long-term horizon much more than men. And actually, we know that this 
uh, was this argument was used many times, for example, during the financial crisis, when they said that, you know, if uh, uh, we had, uh, I mean, um, having more women around would have helped to uh, reduce the risks and the, 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 the negative consequences of the, uh, of the financial crisis. Okay, so uh, I think I can stop here and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor. This was uh, extremely interesting. We have seen that having women in, in, uh, in decision-making uh, positions, it's good for the GDP, it's good for the business, it's a sound uh, business decision, but we still have a lot of uh, uh, problems related to having women in these decision-making positions. Before I leave uh, the floor to our uh, last live speaker that is Gaia. We're gonna broadcast a message from uh, the Italian Minister of uh, Family and Equal Opportunities who couldn't join uh, live because of uh, prior commitments. I'll ask my colleague to share, um, to share the, the video message. Dear Chair, dear participants, I wish to thank the President of PWA, Gerli Sauro, for inviting me today on the occasion of the conference People, Planet and Prosperity, the Gap of Equality. My appreciation goes to all the colleagues who have dedicated their efforts and energy to finalize this event. Today, with confidence, we know that businesses have an active role in supporting the dynamics of change. They were the first to react to the severe economic and social crisis that the pandemic brought. We have proof that the business world holds great potential, and I want to emphasize that it is not just about economic productivity. I am also referring to the promotion of models of environmental and social sustainability in perfect harmony with the three pillars chosen by the Italian presidency of the G20 that look at our planet in its environmental and the human perspectives. Women today are the, at the center of the global reconstruction process, starting from companies we need a complex vision, which starts from the awareness that sectoral and fragmented measures are useless if they are not included in a wide-ranging framework of action. The financial statement of the G20 Conference on Women's Empowerment that I convened with the ministers and the private sector representatives in August contains a guideline to strengthen the role of women in society. We need to promote a transformative and global agenda. This is the main tool to shape to promote gender equality. I wish to emphasize that achieving full women's empowerment comes through positive change, which implies a cultural transformation. Empowerment means eliminating inequalities, but not flattening differences. It means promoting a vision in which the diversity of women does not imply a weak condition, but an element to be valued, and companies are exactly the first agent capable of making the best use of such differences. It is therefore important to give prominence to a true cultural renewal, where stereotypes and discrimination no longer find space to flourish. In this case, the business world can support a dynamic of food free from the consideration that the entrepreneurial attitude is purely made. Women must be placed at the center of employment policies so that they can be leaders to promote a new growth based on a balanced gender approach, far from stereotypes and segregation processes. Education becomes a key factor the promotion of study path for women and girls in STEM discipline has always been one of the main priorities for action that I support and it is the first step towards increasing equality of opportunity and inclusion in sector too long dominated by men alone. The promotion of women's enterprises, not from the point of view of favoritism, but of simplification, is a further tool to fully recognize the merit that for too long we have denied to the female world. At the same time, it also becomes a powerful tool for emancipation, especially where support for women's initiative is linked to the process of liberation from gender-based violence. At this point, I wish to highlight that the Italian government continues to play its role in this regard. 
Eradicating gender stereotypes is one of the key points of the Italian national strategy for gender equality. I strongly wish that Italy would have a comprehensive tool to support women's empowerment in the direction of the European Commission strategy for gender equality. The strategy provides for the creation of enabling conditions for equal career opportunities, competitiveness and flexibility to the support of female participation, in particular by helping parents reconcile life and career and by stimulating female entrepreneurship, especially in the innovative field. Specifically, we have foreseen incentive measures for companies that hire women for the return to work after maternity leave, for the creation of women's businesses and for the provision of facilitated credit, support for business women who are mothers, effective use of part-time and reduction of involuntary part-time, monitoring of diversity and gender parity in companies and the public administration, as well as the introduction of a national certification system for gender parity. While we support the increase in women's employment, we also emphasize its quality. The wonderful work carried out by PWA, the results of the G20 conference on women's empowerment, the finalization of the Italian national gender equality strategy are all steps taken on the same track. They are evidence of a common effort to achieve gender equality. This strength and energy must continue to guide our work as individual groups, companies or institutions, but as a part of a broader goal common to us all. Thank you for your attention and good work. We thank very much the Minister for this video message uh, from which it uh we saw uh, as well as from the presentation of our previous speakers that there are some recurring issues the presence of gender stereotypes the lack of women in stem programs the cultural issue that includes also the need to balance uh, uh, the family between the family life as well so with this i go to our last speaker which is gaia van der esch she is the sherpa of the G20 Empower, and uh, uh, I my question to Ravida because we don't have a lot of time is uh, Gaia. What is uh, what is the private sector, and what uh, what are the recommendations that the G20 Empower gave to the private sector in order to remove some of these uh, issues that were listed uh, previously by our speakers? Yes, thank you, Catherine, and thank you all for the for the interesting presentation. As you say, I think we had we discussed already. We heard all the numbers uh, from Paula Profeta. We heard the legal framework. So I will try and really shift a bit more on the solutions and what we can do concretely to to change things and to change things now. Uh, because despite legal frameworks, despite the terrible numbers that we've been hearing for decades now, things are not changing quickly enough, and, and that's the reality and that's the problem where we really need to. You know, somehow get out of the inertia we've been in for decades, uh, insert a very strong force and make sure that there is a shift uh, that happens in the short term because it's, it's not possible that for decades we hear yes, but cultural shifts take long, but cultural shifts are not really taking place. Um, so this was really the focus of the work of uh, G20 Empower for who doesn't know uh, G20 Empower is the alliance uh, within that was created by G20 leaders in 2018. Uh, it's an alliance between the private sector and the government as part of the G20 to accelerate uh, female leadership. We've seen the numbers. Uh, there's a huge gap and lack of female in top leadership positions and having female in these type of positions can really and gender change uh, much quicker within companies, within governments, within uh, organizations more broadly. So this was really the purpose uh, behind the creation of the G20 Empower, which which I was the Sherpa of this year, and which was chaired by uh, the president of Valore D in Italy, for who knows Valore D, uh, Paola Mascaro. Um, so we really tried to have as a private sector and of course supported by the government, Minister Bonetti was our governmental counterpart for Italy. We really tried to have a very pragmatic hands-on approach. So uh, I'll try and transmit this. What can we do, right? Each of us here is, is an employer or an employee is of course also a don't know, daughter or mother, sister, wife. So we have a lot of citizens, we have a lot of ways uh, in which each of us has a very strong power actually to change things in our daily life, 
to, to, to start changing and accelerating this cultural shift. And there are many tools uh, that we can use to do this. Um, so from the private sector perspective, uh, we've, we've, we've decided to focus on three uh, different topics during the G20 Empower Presidency, which we felt were really priorities uh, to make sure that things change uh, and that we inject this force uh, to accelerate change. Uh, and I'm going to give you a few ideas under these three areas that we've been focusing on in 2021. Uh, in terms of what we can do to change. Um, so first of all, uh, we've been focusing on measurement. Um, I think Paula Profet is an expert of measurement. She's just been giving a whole uh, lecture on this and it, it's difficult uh, to, to, to really get attention and get people behind measurement on one hand, because maybe it seems a bit more like a boring part of the job that not many people want to do, but also because of course it creates accountability and it exposes a lot of weaknesses that have often companies or governments don't want to see exposed. Um, so in terms of measurement, uh, we decided to really make it a priority because if you look at companies and probably if you look in your companies as well where you're working, uh, you will see that there, there are quite a few diversity and inclusion policies and programs that are being rolled out. But if you look at the data, the change is not happening. So one key point, a one key problem behind this is that uh, these programs are not being measured properly, they're not being measured regularly, there is not the, the push and the buy-in and the accountability, also at the CEO level, at the leadership level, but they're rather left as a human resources problem to address, not as a management problem to address. Um, so what we uh, have done as G20 Empower is to first of all say, this must come from the top. Uh, measurement must be a business priority, like any other business priority within a company. Measurement must be also on questions of gender issues, must be a top managerial priority and not only left to the HR department. And there are ways of doing it very pragmatically. For example, we know that in the, in the private sector, uh, there is lots of bonuses linked to the performance of management and it's management at the executive level, but also at the middle level. One idea could be to link part of the bonuses to the performance on specific targets linked to gender uh, parity within companies. So that could be a way of really accelerating. I'm sure that if the money goes in a direction, people might be even more incentivized to, to make this change happen and not wait. Um, another thing that we've done as G20 Empower is also to develop some uh, uh, key performance indicators. So what is it that we need to measure? And we've defined five indicators that you can find in the in the communique, which is actually the G20 Empower communique. I have it here. It's actually, I don't know if you see it because I have the, the screen. Uh, it's a document that you can find online and you can read. And we developed five indicators that we think all companies that have 250 plus employees need to measure every year and need to disclose the data. We need to understand where we stand. We understand, of course, that measurement is scary because as I was saying, it exposes weaknesses, uh, but that's the, the basic starting point to know where we stand and to know where we can improve, where we can fix things and how we can learn from the failures also of a lot of diversity and inclusion programs that are clearly not working well enough. Um, so this is the first focus and of course, each of you as an employee can ask this and should ask this within your companies, ask for more transparency, ask for more measurement, ask for more accountability and for more buy-in from your managerial level uh, to make sure that, that the change is wanted and that the change happens uh, within each of your companies and each of your working environments. Um, the second topic we decided to focus was at the pipeline. I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, Paula also mentioned, and maybe also Francesca, all the problems that they are, uh, of course, across the pipeline to retain and to promote women. And we've seen how women drop out of the workforce at different stages. We've seen all of us and we've witnessed, I think, on our lives, the impact of COVID-19 that has been much stronger on women than on men. And there's so many measures. There's also so many innovations that somehow are coming out from the COVID-19 crisis that we need to leverage uh, to make sure that we strengthen uh, the tight talent pipeline uh, to have more female leaders. Um, and that we really make it also more resilient to future shocks because there will be future shocks and we need to think long-term to, to strengthen this. Uh, of course, this flexible work, um, that's something that as um, we saw before works and we need to maintain. In Italy, I personally was quite surprised, for example, as much as I agree that our public administration is not very efficient, I was surprised by this kind of 
uh, black and white decision to bring everybody back to the offices. My my family, they, they're all in the public administration, and I, I think it's a bit biased to 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 bring everybody back and not learn from the experience we have. I think that should actually be a very strong priority uh, to maintain in Italy. Um, in Italy, we have a clear problem of state-led childcare. We have a very clear problem on parental leave. And I think there are policies that are being taken. And one thing that we're seeing as G20 Empower on this is that there, we can't take halfway policies. They don't work. Uh, and one thing that I was also quite impressed as a Sherpa that we've managed to negotiate and include in the communique is that we need equal parental leave. Uh, that is not only a matter of sharing the care, uh, it's also a matter of eliminating discriminations at work. And until when we don't have equal parental leave, the discriminations are not going to go away. Um, so we had the news a few days ago, I was in Milan uh, also with, with Minister Bonetti, and we had the news that Italy is going to include in the Family Act a proposition of three months uh, of paternal leave, which is, which is a huge improvement. It's a great step. It's not equal yet. Uh, but that's definitely the direction we need to go into, so that's good. Uh, one other thing is quotas. Uh, we, we saw quotas have made a difference, so we really want as G20 Empower to leverage this mechanism. One thing I think it's important to be clear, we don't like quotas in the sense that you know it's not the ideal mechanism in terms of having the risk of being perceived I'm a woman and here because of the quota, because of course that's a reputational risk that comes with it, but it is a mechanism that has worked. Uh, if we look at quotas in Italy with the uh, Golfo Mosca law, we see that there's been a huge increase in what was under the law. We've seen there's been very little change of what is outside that law. Um, and we've seen still that today there's very little change on the executive position. So we have more women on boards. We don't have more women uh, that's not accelerating enough in executive positions. So one idea could be in Italy to introduce quotas also in executive position is something that France uh, is currently approving or has been approved already. Um, and that's something very concrete that we can do. There are many issues. There's transparency and pay gap. And I know we don't have lots of time. We need to work on sponsoring, on mentoring men and women. Uh, we need to work on networking. So there are lots of things to strengthen this pipeline, but that must be a priority. And again, as employers or as employees, it's something we need to work on and ask for a change. Uh, within our companies, and we can do that. We can, when when I'm interviewing for a job, I can ask, do you have a transparent uh, pay gap or pay report from your company, and start putting pressure on companies to disclose this type of data and make them understand that that for employees that is a priority, and we have the right to know uh, and to work for companies that are fair uh, in terms of discrimination towards women. Um, the third topic we decided to work on is. Uh, the future, it's a very difficult topic. We have a lot of problems today, so often we forget to think about the problems we need to face in 10, 20 years time. But I think we've been running behind problems for too long. We need to start really thinking ahead of time and addressing uh, future problems today to make sure that we don't have an even bigger gender gap uh, looking at the future. Uh, the risk is that there will be an even bigger gender gap if we look at the trends, uh, also due to COVID, uh, the years that we will take to reach gender parity globally have increased by a generation. Uh, if we look at the jobs of the future, there is a huge gender gap, even bigger than in the jobs that we have today. Um, so there are lots of challenges that we need to think of today to close this gap. Uh, we mentioned before STEM education, soft skills are extremely important. We need skilling, upskilling, we need training, we need education. Education in Italy especially needs to be our obsession. Uh, to make sure that we don't have uh, and we don't increase uh, the gap uh, that we already have today. An important thing, and I saw there were also some questions on this in the chat, is also shifting leadership models for the future. Uh, I think that during COVID, many of us realized what a leader should be. Uh, and many of us realized that we don't necessarily always have the leaders that we would want to have to manage crisis, to have empathy, uh, to, to, to think about the future, to think in a sustainable way. And we know that a lot of these skills are associated often with women. They're typically leadership traits associated to women. Uh, 
uh, and we saw also very concretely the, the difference between governments led by women and by men uh, on these type of issues. Um, so this is something we need to work on. Uh, again, as also the minister said, uh, uh, gender equality doesn't mean to flatten and to become all the same. It means to accept the differences and also to leverage them. And for the growth of the economy, for the growth of our country, for the growth of our companies, having gender equality is, is definitely, uh, in terms of performance, a plus. Uh, and it will create more sustainable and more performing companies. And so we need to really shift the leadership model and again, work with men uh, uh, to, to do that uh, and work with our colleagues and other women, supporting other women for, for that to happen. Um, and, and I think that's a very important uh, point, along, of course, with the cultural shift that goes around that we were seeing before the jobs that men do, the jobs that women do, everything we learn in school. Uh, today in Italy, we are it, it's, I don't know, I find it outrageous how behind we are on this. And this is a shift we need to do because the new generations are the ones that need to feel equal in terms of opportunities uh, for the long run. Um, one last thing I wanted to say, uh, and then I, I will stop because I know I know we're quite late, um, is that we've, we've created this list uh, of, of actions that you can find uh, in our communique. We've created also a booklet uh, of best practices. It's also publicly available. We've gathered best practices from 23 countries, from 140 companies on how they are addressing these three topics. Uh, so we know, we know very well what the problem is. I think the data, we've heard it 2000 times. It's always important to hear to realize how bad the situation is, but we know what the problem is. We know what we need to do. Like, I think we might have some, amazing ideas in the future years that we didn't have so far, but they're quite few. We know what policies work. Uh, we know what we need to do within companies. The problem is that we're not doing it. There's not the political will. Uh, there's not the will at the level of the leaders in many companies. I think we're having a momentum. I think we are in a moment where things might shift, uh, but we need to put pressure uh, at the different levels. To, to, for change to happen, we need the governments uh, to work with the private sector hand in hand. We need investors to put pressure also on the, pub, on the private sector. We need the public to put pressure on the government. So we really need to all think of our personal role as an employee, as a citizen, as a family member, to, to really make sure that we accelerate this change. I think it, it's a responsibility we somehow all have. Uh, and I think it's great to be here today. And, and one thing I also want to say is that for this change to happen, we need men champions. And, and that's something I've seen. Uh, I was saying before to Francesca, Paola, Catherine, Gurley, everybody that I've, I've been abroad from Italy for 14 years. I've returned last year uh, to work on to, in this role of G20 and Power Sherpa. So I'm relatively new to the gender equality world and to the circles, but I already somehow know the Italian circle on gender equality. It's often the same people speaking to each other it's great because we feel less lonely in the cause, uh, but, but we're not going to shift so much if we just talk to each other and repeat the problem. We need to talk to the people that are not convinced. Uh, we need men to champion us along with women because de facto they have 80% of the power today. So if they don't promote shifts, things are not going to change now. Um, and I think this is a very important thing also to keep in mind, again, at an individual level or at the, at the at company and government level, uh, we need to make sure we go out of our bubble and, and bring these type of messages, this type of data, this type of policies and solutions and make sure they're owned by everybody and not only by us women that are already sensitized to the problem and to the solutions. Thank you very much, Gaia, for your call for action, uh, both from the public and the private sector and at the individual level as well. Uh, we are running out of time, but I think I will address some of the questions that are coming to uh, to some of the speaker. And I'll start with Professor uh, Profeta. We have a question on what do you think of the future of proposal to include uh, the 10 days father leave in the budget law for 2022? Do you think it would be um, will have an economic impact? 
professor, we cannot. Yes, do yes, sorry. Uh, as Kaya said before, I think this is the minimum because actually we are talking about having much more than 10 days uh, because we know that uh, sharing responsibility between men and women is the first step and actually paternity leave, but of course it has to be paternity leave exclusive, so cannot be uh, given to women if the father doesn't take it exclusive, fully paid, I mean, with all these characteristics, which is uh, the, 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 the usual thing in the, in the Nordic countries, for example, uh, in, uh, in Norway. And if we do this, that's very important. We have to do it in the right way. But uh, uh, I mean, 10 days is, is what we have now, although it's not, uh, it's um, like uh, uh, proposed every year. It's not a structural measure, but I think it's the minimum. So I really hope that we can move probably free Months will never, I mean, will not happen, at least not soon, but uh, but much more. Thank you, Professor. A question for Francesca. May you give us uh, some highlights concerning the certification for gender equality introduced for private companies by a recently approved law in the Camera de Deputati? Rewards if the company complies? Uh, yes, sure. Um, so basically, the law is still to be uh, examined by the Senate, of course, so we still don't know whether it will be approved, but it's basically an extension of the scope uh, of the uh, reporting obligation of, under the Equal Opportunity Code, which extends the reporting obligation to companies with more than 50 rather than 100 uh, um, employees. In terms of uh, rewards, of course, there are fiscal benefits for uh, companies complying and as well as uh, sanctions, uh, uh, which are not very high, to be honest, for uh, uh, possible breaches. Thank you, Francesca. Last question for Gaia. Do you think that the measures that are foreseen by the recovery fund include this kind of a, a concrete action call? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I'm positively surprised, I must say, as, as I don't know, as a citizen and as someone that works on this sector from how the government is moving on accelerating gender equality in Italy, I think we had quite a few good directions. I mean, Italy was tragically behind, as we've seen in the data compared to Europe. So it's the minimum that we need to take all these measures to try and accelerate. And I think, of course, the recovery fund, the next generation EU, it's a huge opportunity to shift the tide on gender equality and on many other problematic issues that we have in Italy. I also speak as a younger person, let's say, but of course we have a lot of uh, generational injustice in Italy, uh, opportunities that are not given to uh, to the same extent to, to different uh, people and lots of inequalities that we have in our country. I think it's, it's, a, it's definitely a big opportunity, but I think we also need to remember that we have a very short time frame to invest all this money. Of course, in Italy, investing money and investing in property has always been uh, the main challenge and the main incapacity of a public administration. Um, so there's also a risk associated to it. And, and it's also a problem on looking at the long term. Like we have a short time frame to use this money. We can do some important reforms, we can take some important steps, uh, but this money is not going to be sustained uh, unless there is there is some change beyond 2025, 2026. Um, so somehow we need to make sure that we're not just accelerating on certain topics because now there's so much money. We need to structurally accelerate on these topics in the long run because it's not going to be enough to give one acceleration and then just return uh, to where we have been until now. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much to our speakers. It was a very interesting uh, conference. Uh, we have we are running out of time, so I'll really close the conference by citing uh, the minister. We have to look at our planet in its environmental and human rights perspective. And with this, I close the conference. And it's also on uh, ahead of our next conference will be on environment and climate change and where we're going to underline the role of women and the importance of how she can change climate. Thank you very much once again for everyone who has participated and now we're looking forward to see you at the next conference. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, pa Thank Paula and Francesca and Gaia, and of course, Catherine and to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.